Here we are today in the New Bedford Health Department. I am Brenda Weiss, the Director of Public Health. And with me today I have my Supervisor of Nursing, Andrea Lagu. And we are most pleased today to have a guest speaker, and that is Priscilla Matten from the Bristol County Mosquito Control Project. Um, Priscilla is an expert in bugs and as an entomologist. Today she's going to talk to us about mosquitoes and ticks. So the season's upon us, it's summer, um, we get a lot of questions in the department about mosquitoes and ticks and so Priscilla's going to give us some good information about them and help us learn how to be safe this summer and take care of ourselves and our families. So um, with that I'm going to pass to Priscilla. I want to thank the New Bedford Department of Health for allowing me, uh, Priscilla Matten from Bristol County Mosquito Control, to come and speak to the residents of New Bedford about mosquitoes and ticks and some of the things that you can do this summer to help prevent getting bit by ticks and mosquitoes this year. So we're going to start with some basic information about the Mosquito Control Project. What is Bristol County Mosquito Control? Well, we have a mission statement that talks about the way that we're going to control mosquitoes, not just mosquitoes that have diseases, but also those that are nuisance. And we're going to control these mosquitoes in the most economically and environmentally sensitive way that we can. And this will help us to reduce not only the nuisance, but hopefully any disease like West Nile virus or Tripoli that we may find in your area. We use a variety of different methods, and some of those methods we will discuss that we use to help reduce those mosquitoes in your environment. So some of those things that we do are we, we do mosquito virus surveillance. So that's my main job. So I set out traps throughout Bristol County along with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and we sample mosquitoes from all over the area to look for diseases like West Nile virus and Triple Eight. And this is a cornerstone to any integrated pest management system. So we have to know what kind of pests are out there, what the numbers are, and what the risk is to the population in order for us to do things to help control them. We also do a light trapping program where we use a different type of mosquito trap to look for mosquitoes and count the populations. So that way we have an idea, are they higher, lower, or the same as previous years, and what kind of species are out there. We also have a spraying and summer larvicide program. This is where we treat standing water around your property or in the towns or city that you may live in to help control those mosquitoes that are in the area. This is a service that we offer to the residents as well. So if you live in an area and you have some standing water on your property, you can always call our office 508-823-5253 and tell us about that standing water and we'll go check it, see if there's mosquitoes in it, and if so, then we'll breed it, uh, excuse me, then we'll treat it. We also do catch basin treatment. These are the storm drains along the sides of the roads. We will treat those as well. And this is an important area for West Nile virus and the mosquito that comes from this area is very important for West Nile virus. So we will make those applications as well throughout the city and out throughout different towns. We also offer ground-based ULV, adult deciding. This is when you can call our office and we'll come to your area and we'll spray by road on a truck um, for adult mosquitoes that may be flying in the area. Applications are normally made between 2 a.m. and sunrise and this is to help reduce any environmental risk to pollinators such as bees because bees are not usually active during these times and also this helps us reduce any other effects that we might have on any non-targets and we'll be focusing just on controlling mosquitoes. We do water management. This is something that we do all year round where we will uh, clean out ditches, roadside ditches, um, salt marsh ditches and things like that that are blocked up that may cause water to stand and standing water produces mosquitoes. So what we want to do is we want to remove any blockages and this will allow the water to continue moving, reducing mosquito breeding in the area. And then of course public outreach, things like this in times when I'm able to attend functions and citywide or town based activities to help explain some of the things that go on and some of those personal protection measures that you can do to help reduce mosquito bites for yourselves. So why are mosquitoes important? Mosquitoes are important because they spread diseases. So things like West Nile virus and Tripoli e, we know about here in Massachusetts and they're very important to us. Also dog heartworm is also transmitted by mosquitoes. So if you have your dog you want to keep an eye on that. Um, and then when you travel further out you have things like malaria 
And then now, because of what's going on in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, we have information now with dengue and chikungunya. So these are two diseases that you can bring back from traveling. So you want to make sure that you're taking personal precautions, not just when you're here in Massachusetts, but also when you're traveling abroad into other states. So it's always important to look at the different things that might be occurring in other states or other countries that you may be traveling into. So what's interesting about the mosquitoes in Massachusetts? Well, we have 51 different types of mosquitoes here in Massachusetts, and they are a total different variety of mosquitoes uh, from each other. So we have some mosquitoes that uh, only bite birds. We have some mosquitoes that only bite uh, humans and other mammals. We have other mosquitoes that are more opportunistic. And this plays a factor. And this is why our surveillance program is very important, because it gives us an idea of what's going on in the environment. Only the female mosquito bites, but they don't always bite people. And then we have a variety of different ways that those mosquitoes live. And this becomes important, especially in the fall, when we talk about the end of the season and the mosquitoes going away after the first hard frost. So when the mosquitoes go away for the first hot frost, they actually, some will die off, but some will go into hibernation. And they hibernate some as adults, some as larvae in the water, and then some as eggs. So let's talk a little bit about the life cycle of the mosquito. So it has a complete metamorphosis, so it starts where the female lays her eggs. So she'll lay anywhere between 150 to 300 eggs per blood meal, and she'll lay those eggs either right on top of the water or right above the water line. And then when the water line reaches over the eggs, the eggs will hatch and the mosquito larvae will come out. And then other ones need to be right on top of the water at all times. So it's very easy to kill the mosquitoes if you dump out the water. You get the larval stage. This requires water, and it requires water all the way through the time that they emerge as an adult. And in the larval stage, these mosquitoes need still water, no moving water. So they're not going to be in things like rivers and streams or in the ocean or anything like that. They're going to be in stagnant, still water. And they need to be in water that's not very deep either because they do breathe air, but they need to filter feed and move through the water column in order to come in contact with food. So they will move up and down within the water column. So anything over about two to three feet deep, you're probably not going to have many mosquitoes living in there. So this is a good thing to know when you're dumping out your standing water. And you want to make sure that you're looking for wigglers that may be living in the water and dump those out to help prevent those mosquitoes from breeding right in your own backyard. We have the pupil stage, which is a non-feeding stage that uh, is when the mosquito is changing from its larval form into its adult form. And then the adult mosquito will emerge off of the water. And there are males and females. And the female is the only one that takes a blood meal. So when we're talking about the larval stage, what we're concerned about at Bristol County Mosquito Control are some of those areas that are too big for the public to do anything about. These are your roadside ditches, your freshwater flood areas, your um, cedar swamps that we have, cattail marshes, big areas like this around. These are the areas that we'll go in and we will larvicide and help control the mosquitoes in the larval population. What we would like is for you and the residents to look around your house and look for areas where mosquitoes may be breeding right in your own yard. So these are areas like tires, which are a great place for mosquitoes to breed. Because no matter how you place a tire, whether up straight, up and down, or flat, it can always hold water. And mosquitoes need that water. Things like untreated swimming pools, especially if you leave the top on top of it. Uh, kitty pools, a lot of people like to use kitty pools for their pets. Um, to swim in during the summer, but they are perfect mosquito breeding grounds. Things like bird baths and buckets and other areas around your house that can breed mosquitoes. And these are the areas that we want you to dump out. So we want you to drain those areas and remove that standing water. Chances are, if you're breeding them in your backyard, then you're probably going to be feeding them in your own backyard. So every three to five days, just go and dump out the water, and that'll help remove those breedings. Again, only the female takes a blood meal. And this is important because of our 51 different species, like I mentioned, not all the female mosquitoes feed on people. So some of them only feed on reptiles and um, things like frogs as well. And then other ones are more opportunistic, where they'll feed on both, uh, excuse me, both birds and on, on mammals. 
So this is important when we're talking about things like West Nile virus and Tripoli. So this is one of the things that we look at, especially closely, when we're talking about West Nile virus and Tripoli. But we always get asked, how far does a mosquito fly? So this is important because we like to think of our community, a city of New Bedford, but we have to remember that we're surrounded by all these other communities. And some mosquitoes can fly quite a distance. So we have to be aware of what's going on around us as well as what's going on right in our own town. So some mosquitoes, like those backyard breeders that we want you to help dump out those standing water, they're not going to go very far. Maybe they'll fly a mile or so, but they're not really going to go very far. But then there are other mosquitoes that can easily fly five to ten miles, things like cattail mosquitoes. Um, and then the one that's important for Triple E, the uh, cedar swamp mosquito, that can fly easily ten miles, but it's going to return back to its natural habitat in order to lay its eggs. But we're going to get that movement in the ability of Tripoli to be out in other areas besides where we're used to. And then the salt marsh mosquito is probably our best flyer in Massachusetts where they'll fly easily 20, 25 miles from a salt marsh. And because they come off in large groups or large broods after those monthly uh, high tides, then we tend to get a lot of these mosquitoes and problems, not just in your local area, but all over. But when we talk about West Nile virus in Tripoli, when the Mass Department of Public Health puts out their risk assessment, it's important to know that when your neighboring town is uh, at a risk level, then you also may be at that risk level. So it's important to just keep an eye on that and remember that mosquitoes don't obey borders and they will move throughout the different areas. So when we talk about West Nile and Tripoli, what we are going to hear is we're going to hear about this sort of bird biting mosquito and this cycle that always takes place in the environment. So there's going to be this bird mosquito interaction and this is true for West Nile or Tripoli. Different birds, different mosquitoes, but same concept of the cycle. And what we'll hear in the news is that West Nile virus or Tripoli was found in a primarily bird biting mosquito. And this cycle is going to take place every year and it's going to take place probably more in the swamp areas, except for West Nile virus, which can take place pretty much anywhere. And this cycle will go on and on throughout the season, and we will monitor this. But then at some point, what ends up happening is another mosquito will be involved, this opportunistic mosquito, this bridge vector as it's termed, that isn't quite so picky what's, what it feeds on. So she will feed on a bird that may have West Nile virus or Tripoli, e, and then for her second blood meal, she'll go and she'll feed on something else like a human or a horse. So this is important because this is a time of year when we'll start talking about West Nile virus or Tripoli e was found in human biting mosquitoes, and we want you to make sure that you're taking extra special precautions then. So important to know that precautions should be taken at all times because when that happens, when it goes from just the bird cycle to a human cycle, we don't know that until we get results. So it's always important to make sure that you're using protection. Humans and horses are considered incidental infections or dead end hosts because of the way that the virus works within their body and in the horse's body. So if you or your loved one or your horse gets West Nile or Tripoli, e, you cannot go and infect a mosquito and cause that virus to go on in your community. You are at no risk for doing that and infecting more mosquitoes. So that's why the infection sort of stops when it gets into a human and horse. That's not true with some other viruses but that is true for West Nile and Tripoli. So it's not spread person to person um, or for human to horse contact if a mosquito was to bite either of those people. Let's talk a little bit about ticks. So ticks are a little bit different than mosquitoes because mosquitoes can fly to you and you just may be in your backyard and a mosquito is going to fly into your backyard and now you have a mosquito problem. Whereas with ticks, you generally have to go where the ticks are. So you're going to be walking along that path, you're going to be um, in the woods, you're going to be cleaning up around your house and uh, doing mulch or raking leaves. These are the areas where you're going to find ticks. So ticks, especially deer ticks, they transmit Lyme disease. And it's a very important disease here in Massachusetts and something that we need to keep an eye on. Um, you want to avoid the tick habitat during the time of the year when ticks are most active, which is pretty much from May to September. And you want to make sure that you keep an eye out for these ticks as you're going into these areas. 
So usually deer ticks, which are the ones that are more important because they are the ones that transmit Lyme disease, you're going to find them in more of your woody, brushy areas. Not in your manicured grass areas, but in the areas right along the edge of your property or when you're walking on a path along the edge of the paths. So what we know about the life cycle that's a little bit different is that deer ticks have a two-year life cycle. So deer ticks lay their eggs and then they have a very small uh, larval stage, which are on very, very, uh, they're on small um, rodents and on birds, and then you have the nymphal stage. And it's a nymphal stage that is very small and one that we think is very important in the spread of Lyme disease. Because of the small size of the nymphal tick, it's very easy to miss and very likely that we could have more infections transmitted by this small tick. And this tick then changes after the blood meal into an adult. So you're going to have both nymphal and adult ticks out for a good portion of the year and you're going to have that two year life cycle going on. Um, all the time. So what we want to do is we want to avoid those areas where we think we can come in contact with ticks, especially in the late spring and the summer. Also an important time to remember is in the fall for the adult tick, especially when we're raking our leaves in our yard and then allowing our kids to jump in our leaves. White-footed mice, which are great for transporting ticks around, are notorious for getting into that leaf litter and then possibly dropping off ticks as you guys are uh, raking up your leaves and letting the kids roll around in it. So we just want to keep an eye on that and make sure that we check ourselves for ticks. So what's different about ticks is that they quest. So mosquitoes do, you know, search out their, their host and they use things like carbon monoxide uh, for long distance attracting and then the sweat on your skin uh, as they come in closer to find out if you're going to be a good host. Ticks on the other hand, they don't fly, they don't jump. All they can do is wait for you to walk by and then they will come attached. So that's called questing. And they'll wait at the edge of a leaf are a piece of uh, grass or a bush and they'll wait for you to come by and then they will grab onto your clothes and then they will walk up your body until they find an area suitable for them to uh, obtain a blood meal. So one of the things we want to know about ticks is that when we remove a tick, we always want to grab the tick as close to the head as possible with a nice pair of tweezers and pull directly out and we want to do this as soon as we find the tick. Now, the reason why we don't want to do some of the other things, so we might remember that we used to put Vaseline or we used to put some sort of petroleum jelly or dish soap or something over the tick. This is not a good idea and the reason why is that all insects, including ticks, which are not our insects, but they all breathe through their body and when you smother them, what you're essentially doing is suffocating them. Well, while the tick is backing out of your skin, they're going to be continuing to regurgitate saliva into your skin. And it's in that saliva that the bacteria for Lyme disease is held. So the more that they uh, salivate back into you, the bigger your chances are of getting West Nile, uh, excuse me, of Lyme disease. So you want to reduce that risk by removing the tick as quick as possible and not giving it that time to inject more saliva into you. So it's very important for you to just take it as close to the head and pull it out. Any questions, you can always take the tick, put it in a plastic baggie, put the name of the person it was attached to, um, the location on the body, the date, and then throw it in your freezer just in case maybe uh, a few weeks from now you notice a rash or some other symptoms and you're interested in maybe getting the tick tested or at least the tick looked at. And this will help you if something does happen later on in a few months or so, you could say, that's right, I forgot, I had a tick on me. Because most people don't ever remember being bitten by ticks. So more information that we have, the better off that you are. You're going to want to make sure that you remove your clothes when you come in from, say, doing your hike or doing your yard work, if you can. Don't put it in your hamper right in your bathroom because the ticks can easily walk out. What you want to do is if you're not going to wash the clothes right away but you're concerned, then throw the clothes in the dryer for 20 minutes on high. That'll kill the tick and you can help reduce spreading ticks just around your house. You're going to want to check your pets and you're going to want to make sure that you're checking yourself. So do tick checks. 
So we talk about the five D's of prevention for mosquitoes, and this is important, and if anything, this is the things that I'd like you to remember from my presentation. The five things that you can do to help reduce mosquito bites. Dust, dawn, dress, deep, and drain. Those are the ones that are most important. So let's talk about them a little bit more. Dusk and dawn. Mosquitoes are most active between dusk and dawn. So you want to avoid as much activity as you can during those times, which I know is very difficult because it's either when the kids are going you know, to wait outside for the school bus or it's when everybody gets home from work and you're ready to sit out in your backyard and enjoy a barbecue. So we know that avoiding activities at this time is very difficult. So if you can't avoid the activities, let's dress appropriately. So let's wear long sleeves, let's wear long pants and try to help avoid any open skin where a mosquito could bite you. Of course, it's also very difficult with 90% humidity and 90 degrees summer days. So I can understand that that's not going to be one of your best choices. So what do we suggest again is to use repellent or DEET. That's your third D. Something, fourth D, something to help reduce mosquito bites, things that can help prevent things. So the CDC recommends a few different products to be used. DEET is one of the ones that has been studied the most and probably available in the most formulations. Really for the average, you probably don't need above 20 to 30 percent DEET. You always want to read the label when you're making an application of a repellent. They will tell you things like how often you need to reapply, who should be wearing the uh, repellent? Is it appropriate for children? DEET is not appropriate for children under six months. And if you have a child that's under six months or under a year, uh, you know, you're going to want to more dress them appropriately. And if they're in a carriage, perhaps use a, a bug net around them. This will help as opposed to actually using a repellent. But you want to re read the directions for the repellent. Um, Picaridin is another uh, option that's produced by Cutter. Oil of lemon eucalyptus is an option. It's not approved for young kid use, so again, you'll want to read the, the um, label. You can use IR3535, which is the product that's found in Avon Skin So Soft, but there are a variety of Skin So Soft products, so you need to make sure that you get the one that includes the product that's going to help reduce mosquitoes. And then permethrin. And permethrin is a great option too because it works not only against mosquitoes but also against ticks. So this is different and this is not going to be found in your normal repellent area. This is going to be found in the area of your camping section. Permethrin goes on your clothing or on your gear, not on your skin. That's why it's always important that you read the directions before you use these products. And you can find out that you can use it, say, on a pair of work gloves that you use when you're cutting wood or uh, raking leaves. Or say you're a gardener and you have some equipment that you only use. Say your kids have play clothes that they only use when they're going out. You can spray the clothes, you can spray the shoes, you can spray the equipment when they're not on you or you're not using them. Let them dry somewhere between two to four hours before you wear them. And then it will be protected. And in most cases, it can be protected for over two weeks and you can wash the product and the protection will still be there. So this is really great for those things that we use just to make sure that we are keeping um, mosquitoes and ticks off of us when we're out. And then the other thing we want to do is we want to re reduce the mosquito populations around your house. And we do that by using our fifth D, which is to drain it. And that means chuck it or check it, okay? so. I don't have any problem if you want to keep your bird bath, that's great, no problem. Just check it every three to five days, dump the water off and, re and refill it. Um, if you don't need something, get rid of it, chuck it. There's no reason to keep it. Do we need the tire? Probably not. Let's recycle it. Do we, do we need all of those uh, empty flower pots around our house? Probably not. Let's get rid of them. If you want to keep it, that's fine. Just remember to drain the water so that you're not feeding the mosquitoes that are breeding right in your backyard. So these are some of the ways. So we want to make sure that we reduce mosquito bites by using DEET, avoid activity between dusk and dawn. We want to drain. And we want to make sure that we dress appropriately when needed and when we're going to be outside. So here's some contact information for the Bristol County Mosquito Patrol. Again, my name is Priscilla Matten. You can always contact the Mosquito Patrol. You can find our information at our website, bristolcountymosquitocontrol.com. You can follow us on Twitter, and we will have postings about things that are going on for mosquitoes in the area. And if you have any questions, feel free to always call our office. Thank you.
On behalf of Brenda Weiss and I, we just want to thank you, Priscilla, for coming today and Bristol County Mosquito Control for doing this terrific presentation. Um, the entire city will benefit from it, and we greatly appreciate all of your hard work um, that you do for us. If anybody has any questions, feel free to contact the health department at 508-991-6199, and we will hopefully answer any questions you have, maybe regarding spraying or mosquito or tick-borne diseases. Um, please, by all means, call if you have anything. Um, if we cannot help you, we will absolutely refer you to Bristol County Mosquito Control, and they will definitely be able to assist you. So once again, Priscilla and everyone at Bristol County Mosquito Control who does such a great job, thank you so much for coming and we hope to work with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.